So thanks, uh, Christos. It's uh, very nice to be back here in Berkeley. Um, today I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing um, over a number of years. Uh, I guess it started for me almost as a bit of a hobby back in 2000, as I'll explain, uh, sort of a project on the side. But it's, um, it sort of involved a number of people along the way, and more recently um, biologists, um, people like Bill Martin in Dusseldorf, who work very actively in this area of origin of life. Uh, most of the work today will be work with Wim Hordijk, a postdoc, uh, Josh, a student at, with us in Christchurch, uh, Elkana Mossel, who's in the statistics uh, department here at Berkeley, and a little bit of uh, recent work with Stuart Kaufman. So, of course, uh, the origin of life is a very uh, uh, difficult question, and, and many people have um, thought about it all the way back to Charles Darwin, who speculated about the warm little pond idea he had. And in a talk such as this, there's no time really to go into all the many and varied theories of how life began. Uh, let me just say, in summary, that there are many ideas. Some are very specific, like the Martin and Russell idea of the hydrothermal vents and the way biochemistry got going. Uh, there's general, I suppose there's a, a fair amount of agreement that somehow RNA uh, played a dominant role early on in life rather than before DNA. But there's a lot of debate about what you might call the chicken uh, or egg problem. Was it uh, genetics first or metabolism first or some combination of both? Uh, I think it's fair to say though that uh, whatever early life was like, it was a lot simpler than it is today. If you look inside, for example, a cell of E. coli, you'll see maybe 2,000 or more reactions and a similar number of molecules. And they're all highly organized in the sense that um, all those reactions, the reactants, are either uh, available in the environment or they're produced by other reactions. And every reaction is catalyzed by some enzyme or cofactor because it all has to work in some sort of synchronized fashion. So there are many problems uh, concerning the origin of life, but one in particular seems to be the following. That it would seem that uh, an early step would, would be, that seems to be required, is that you have some, the emergence of some self-sustaining autocatalytic network of reactions. That is, a set of reactions that's sustained either by what's there in the environment or what's produced by those reactions and autocatalytic in the sense that each reaction is catalyzed also by something produced by the system. I'll talk about this uh, later, this particular example. Uh, so why is catalysis important? Well, you all know probably that it speeds up reactions enormously by many orders of magnitude, so that will stop uh, reactants diffusing before they've had time to react. But, and you see this in this graph here, this, uh, these are uncatalyzed reaction rates, and these are the catalyzed rates. But what's more striking, or equally striking, is that the variance, or the variation, in the reaction times is much narrower for catalyzed reactions than it is for uncatalyzed. So you have the opportunity of synchronizing processes. So the rates are not only faster, but they're more tightly coordinated. So there's uh, a certain amount of formalizing in this talk, and I'm just going to start here. I might write some things on this whiteboard. I take it I must never write on here, must I? <laughs> okay, uh, so for, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to say a catalytic reaction system is a quadruple. It's a set of molecule types, a set of reactions, a set of catalysis pairs, and a food set. So the reactions are just uh, some molecules come out and some molecules some molecules come in to the reaction, and some molecules go out. So the things coming in we call reactants, the things coming out we call products. And I'll denote them in this way, rho and pi. The catalysis is just a set of ordered pairs. A molecule catalyzes a reaction. We'll regard that as an ordered pair, XR. 
Okay, so here's, here's a reaction, two molecules produce two products. The food set will simply be a subset of the molecule types. Okay, so I'm just going to write this up first so we remember this, the basic setup of a CRS. We've got X, a set of reactions we start with, a catalysis pattern, and a set of food molecules. Food means those go in and start? Yeah, so food is just what's available in the environment. In the context of early life, this would be what molecules were available early on. Uh, okay, so that's a sort of an abstract view, perhaps a, a more pictorial view, is to think of this as a directed uh, bipartite graph. You have a, two sorts of um, vertices, the molecules, which we've indicated here with uh, solid dots, and the reactions, which we've indicated with little square, white squares. And you have two types of arrows. You have, uh, for example, here, um, this food molecule comes in to this reaction and goes out, but you also have these catalysis arcs. So the arrows denote, one type of arrow denotes um, reactants coming in and products going out. The other dashed arrows are representing catalysis. And the food molecules I'll, I'll indicate in green. So I suppose really I could almost say we've got three types of vertices. We've got molecules, and some of those happen to be food and some not. Uh, and we've got um, the reactions. Okay, so this, these are two examples of catalytic reaction systems. So here's a very simple model of such a system, somewhat abstract model. Uh, it's called the, um, uh, we'll call it the binary polymer model. We imagine sets of molecules represented by strings over an alphabet. This could be ACGT or whatever, but let's think of binary strings just to keep things simple. I'm going to consider bo uh, binary polymers up to length N, and the food molecules will just be the short things, perhaps monomers and dimers. So T here might typically be perhaps 2. So the sorts of reactions we're interested in are what are called ligation and cleavage reactions. Ligation reaction, we just take two strings and we concatenate them, a ligation, we take a string and we just cut it somewhere and separate them. So this is a, a subset of all of the reactions in this binary polymer model and um, uh, these would be some of the reactions. Here is the, the food set or some of the, I don't, <laughs> some of the molecules down here. And we're going to be interested in the following uh, model. We're going to suppose that this catalysis I've drawn here is just randomly assigned. I look at each molecule, I look at each reaction, I toss a biased coin, with probability P I put a catalyzation arc in there. That is an extremely naive and simple model. Uh, I'm going to call it the vanilla model, because there's all sorts of <coughs> extensions of that. Perhaps the probability of catalysis depends on the length of this molecule, perhaps it depends on how well X somehow uh, fits the corresponding <coughs> reactants and product. But for now, whenever I talk about the vanilla model, I'm thinking of this very most simple situation. So why did I get interested in this? Well, there was this early claim by Kaufman that somehow in this binary polymer model, if you fix P and you let N get large enough, then you will find these self-sustaining autocatalytic systems inevitably arising, arising with certainty. A little bit like what happens with random graphs. As you add edges, eventually it becomes um, connected with high probability. Of course, eventually it becomes just a clique if you add enough. Um, and um, so I wanted to sort of uh, think about this a little more mathematically. Um, Kaufman proved a theorem here, and that theorem is uh, absolutely correct. But um, the reason I got interested was this paper by Lifson, who pointed out, well, what Kaufman asserts is true, but if you keep the probability of catalyzation constant and you increase n, it requires uh, uh, the average number of reactions that each molecule catalyzes has to grow exponentially with the sequence length. And that's bi biochemically totally unreasonable. So each molecule would have to catalyze a huge number of reactions. Uh, there's other criticisms um, 
which have been made, and I want to address all of these in my talk. But in order to make some progress on this first question, what I wanted to, to think about with uh, Lisson's criticism is, um, well, that's true, but what if you allow P not to be constant, allow it to perhaps decrease with, um, with N? Uh, what would happen in that case? Okay, so we're going to use some uh, fairly simple mathematics to try and um, look at the how this binary polymer model behaves, what level of catalysis is really needed in order to uh, ensure self-sustaining autocatalytic system. But we need to formalize some notions first, and I think you'll appreciate why, because I've been saying things like uh, self-sustaining autocatalytic system. What does that really mean? When we formalize it, we'll see that there are subtle differences in what that could mean, and they have a big impact on what the answer would be. So we need some definitions. So given any subset R of my initial set of reactions, now this is true, what I'm saying in these next few slides is for any catalytic reaction system, not just the binary polymer model. Okay? So given any subset of reactions, we'll say the closure of the food set is all of the molecules that I can get by just applying the reactions in that subset repeatedly. All the molecules I can build up. Closure of F. And exactly, and that's whether they are catalyzed or not. Ignoring catalysis. So formally it's a unique minimal subset of X that contains F and that satisfies this, this property. Of course, the closure of F um, is easy to compute, polynomial time, in the size of Q. Whenever I say polynomial time here, I don't mean anything to do with N. I'm talking about the size of the input. Second definition, F generated. We say that a subset of reactions is F generated if it, the closure contains every reactant of every reaction in R. So this system here, I haven't shown any catalysis because that's not relevant at this point. Uh, this is F generated. I use these and I generate that and then these two generate that and you see I can build it all up. It's F generated. F generated implies of course that each reactant of any reaction in R is either in F or as a product of some other reaction in R. Now is the converse true? Trick question. Um, well, it turns out not to be. I mean, here's an example where this is true, but this is not F generated. I couldn't start with F and just using my reactions generate this. Once this is going, it's going to keep going, but it's never going to start. Okay, this, this is able to start and keep going but uh, this is not. So this is not F generated. So important distinction between F generated and not. So now we come to the main idea, which is what we call a, a RAF. Um, it's a subset of reactions that satisfies these two, three properties. First of all, it should be non-empty. Secondly, every reaction in that set should be catalyzed either by the product of some other reaction or perhaps by an element of the food set, and it needs to be F generated. So here is um, uh, CRS. Is that a, a RAF, an RAF? Does it satisfy those properties? Certainly non empty. <laughs> um, but you see, only this part of it is a, an RAF. This reaction, for example, is not catalyzed at all. Let's look at the earlier example I showed you. Uh, can we see any RAFs in there? Uh, well, I can see one just here. These are the food sets and that catalyzes that, so that's one. What about over here? Well, this is, you can check, that's an RAF, so too is that. And if I put them together, then they will be also, that's also an RAF. Uh, is that the biggest RAF? Well, no, it's not, because now that this is established, I can add that in. This reaction R5 by itself is not an RAF, but I can add it to this set there and get an RAF. Okay, so that would be the maximal RAF. So at this point you ask questions like, hmm, is there always a unique maximal RAF? And you see actually, yes there is, because, well, before I come to that, let me just say that this notion has an equivalent definition that's perhaps easier to pass. 
uh, subset is an RAF, it's non-empty, and each reaction R in that set, all of the reactants and at least one catalyst of R are present in the closure of F under R. That's another way of thinking about it. So this is an RAF here. Um, uh, it's F generated and every reaction is catalyzed. But it's okay if I like need a huge number of reactions to happen before the first catalyst is produced and then it goes back and that, catalyzes. That is a very good question. Uh, absolutely, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In fact, you may be interested to know that computing the smallest number of reactions that has to happen uncatalyzed in a given RAF um, in, in, uh, is an NP hard problem to calculate. So, so some of the reactions require a catalyst and some don't? All of the reactions require to be catalyzed, but you see here what happens is this reaction, this first one, has to uh, start without catalyst. Eventually the catalyst okay. is produced. Yeah. I'll come to that distinction in a little bit in two more slides. I want to just state a couple of fairly obvious um, but very useful properties of RAFs. First of all, the union of two RAFs is an RAF, as we saw before. That's fairly easy to verify. Um, it follows that any catalytic reaction system has a unique maximal RAF, namely the union of all of the RAFs it contains. Secondly, there's a simple algorithm to determine whether or not Q has an RAF, and if so, to compute the maximum one. I'm sure the computer scientists among you will, by the time I get to the slide after the next, will have figured this algorithm out, but let me just um, say why it's useful. It's useful because it means you can take very large systems and very quickly find the max RAF or see if there is a, a, a RAF in there at all. So now I come uh, to this, some of the questions that have been uh, very pertinent about catalysis. We've got the notion of a RAF. A stronger notion would be this notion that, hang on, we need to catalyze everything before it'll happen. We call this a constructively autocatalytic F-generated uh, process. A weaker notion than a RAF is this, where every reaction has is, um, its reactants and at least one catalyst is a product of another reaction or it's in the food set. This we call a pseudo-RAF. This is not a RAF. Again, this could never start, whereas this could start. And why do I say that? I say that because if the reactants aren't there, the reaction can't happen. But if the catalyst is not there and the reactants are, the reaction can happen, but at a low rate. So I think this is somehow a good compromise. Eventually this will get going, and then it's going fast somehow. We'll see there's good mathematical reasons too why RAFs are more interesting in some sense than this stronger notion of CAF. Well, I, don't think, I think the more interesting one is the constructively autocatalytic rather than the RAF. Because if the RAF inevitably starts, then it can't actually be relevant for evolution. You need something which has a low probability of starting unless uh, by some low probability reaction catalyst has arisen there um, so that it can actually be a rare event which is um, transmitting information. If, if something's inevitable, uh, then it can't be relevant for evolution. Wait, I thought you were, you were agreeing with him. You're saying no, that the RAF is, is more interesting. No, I'm saying that the, the constructively autocatalytic one is more interesting than the RAF. That's one that starts easier. Yeah. That's no, one that starts you, rapidly. No, you need to have uh, the, all the catalysts there in the first place for the constructive uh, catalytic. Yeah, I guess, I guess we're sort of thinking that you know early on there wasn't much and we needed somehow to work with minimal things. We didn't want the luxury of everything being sitting there waiting to catalyze. I, I, I take your point, and perhaps we can discuss that um, afterwards. Uh, so the RAF algorithm um, uh, is very simple. Of course, you just uh, start with your original set of reactions and you just construct a a nested decreasing sequence. Uh, all, at each step, all you do is you throw out all the reactants that, um, or all the reactions rather, that fail to have all their reactants uh, and any catalyst uh, in the closure of what you've constructed so far. And if at the end, you're, I mean, this is a decreasing sequence of subsets of a finite set, so it must terminate, you'll either end up with the empty set, in which case there is no RAF in the system or it will be the max RAF. 
Actually, you can make this algorithm a little more efficient by iterating uh, this step um, by computing the max pseudo ref because max pseudo ref is really can be solved in linear time by um, algorithms that for horn satisfiability. It's a nice way of encoding this problem. Okay, um, back to the Kaufman story. We want to look at the full binary polymer model. So that's all binary sequences of lengths up to n over two letters. Uh, the number of molecules is uh, 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared up to 2 to the n, which is 2 to the n plus 1 more or less. And this is the number of reactions. The reactions are all cleavage and ligation reactions. So I'm just going to write some of these down. And mu is the average number of reactions catalyzed by any given molecule. So if in the case where you have um, probability molecule X catalyzes reaction R, this will just be um, P times R0. So what we're interested in is what's the probability that the, the set we start with contains within it an RAF, PM. I'm sorry, can you remind me what P is? P is just a fixed constant for the moment. Uh, the probability that a given molecule catalyzes any other given oh, reaction. I see. So, okay. mm -hmm. so, so it's the probability that, that the molecule is a catalyst. For yes, something. exactly. Yeah. So this would be the expected number of reactions that a given molecule catalyzes in the vanilla model. Okay, so uh, Kaufman, as I said, um, established that with P is constant, that is, doesn't depend on n, that Pn goes to 1 as n goes to infinity. And in a way, though, the result is a little unsatisfactory for two reasons. First of all, it requires, you see, this is growing at this rate. So if P is constant, mu is growing at that exponential rate. Uh, but also, the ref you end up with is all reactions. So it's sort of like what Irish Zasmaray sometimes calls the tar or whatever. You just get everything, and that's sort of not really interesting. Um, so what if mu were to grow more slowly. And this is where I got interested in this and I established these first two results that if uh, mu is less than 130 e to the minus 1, the probability there was a ref would go to 0. If it was bigger than quadratic, uh, well, I should say bigger than c n squared, where c is more than log 2 to the base e, then it would go to 1 as n goes to infinity. And the reviewer of, uh, one of the reviewers of that paper, David Sankoff, uh, said, well, this is all fine, but you need to make a conjecture about what the real rate is. Is it, is it, um, is it uh, constant? Is it quadratic? And I just had no idea, really. I said, oh, I conjecture that it's subquadratic. <laughs> okay. So then um, I had, uh, didn't know how really to make much progress, but I was fortunate to have a postdoc, Wim Hordijk, uh, come to New Zealand for a little while. And he said, well, let's try simulating. And I said, no, we want to prove a theorem. He said, well, let's see anyway. <laughs> OK, and so what he found was the, um, this is mu. And these are different values of n, 8, 10, 12, and so forth. And you see there's this sort of sharp transition that occurs. This is the probability that there is a ref within the system. And you see it sort of drifting to the right. And what does that trend look like? If I sort of look at when is there a 50% chance of having a ref there, and I graph that, you see it's starting to look like it's a bit of a straight line. So maybe, maybe a linear relationship would be the right thing. It's sort of suggestive anyway. And actually, I was a little less um, scathing of the simulation approach um, because it at least gave some sort of idea of what might be going on. Uh, but I had no way of proving it until um, I came to uh, Berkeley and had the fortune of meeting with Elkan and Marcel, who um, had some very nice ideas how, of how to look at this problem. And um, we were able to show uh, this result. That basically, it is linear. It is the transition point. And the result I've put up here is certainly not the strongest. If uh, this delta here, I could, I could replace n to the 1 plus delta by n times log n, if you like, or n times log log n, or whatever. And same here. Basically, if it's faster than linear, the probability of a ref goes to 1. If it's slower than linear, it goes to 0. In fact, one can say even a little bit more that 
for any given n, so not a limiting statement, but for any given n, uh, if mu is greater than lambda n, then the probability that there exists a ref within this binary polymer system uh, is at least 1 minus 2, 2e two to the minus lambda to the t. t is the size of the food set, so maybe 2 over 1 minus 2e to the minus lambda, which of course goes to 1. The nice thing about this statement is it's not asymptotic, it's true for any given value of n. And if you work rather than over a two-letter alphabet, over a k-letter alphabet, it's really easy. You just change that to k. Okay, so it's nothing mysterious happens when you move to more than two letters. So here's the interesting thing, though, the contrast with CAFs. These were the ones you had to build up uh, automatically. In this case, the story is totally different. You really do need exponential uh, growth rate in the expected number of reactions catalyzed. <coughs> it's, it's a 2 to the n type relationship. So Lifson, yeah, Lifson was, was sort of right in, in, in a certain sense that um, if, if you insist on the stronger notion of a CAF, you really do need exponential rates. But if you're happy to live with RAFs, the things that could get started and then become um, faster, then it's definitely uh, much slower. So we found this contrast uh, in these rates rather surprising, perhaps you wouldn't think too much about there being a big difference. So more recently we've been interested in uh, what happens with the sizes of RAFs when they emerge in this binary polymer model. Once again, oh, well, first of all I should say we know that finding the biggest RAF is easy, what about finding the smallest RAF? It turns out that there's a reduction with the problem um, vertex cover that shows that this is MP hard. Given an instance of vertex cover, you can construct a catalytic reaction system for which um, the corresponding problems agree. So let's say that a ref is irreducible if it contains no proper subref. In other words, if I remove any reaction from it, there's no ref anymore in that system. So finding a new ref is easy. You take the max ref, pull out a, a reaction, uh, see if there's a subref, etc. And you, if it doesn't, you put that back and try another one. So it's easy in terms of the, the polynomial and the size of the system. But the problem is it can be exponentially many irreducible RAFs. Here is a uh, contrived system I've created that has exactly eight uh, irrefs. And you, by, if you look closely at what, what's gone on here, you could see how to do that for two to the n uh, irrefs. And you might think, well, maybe all the URFs have the same size. They do in this example, but actually that's not the case. In the binary polymer model, when we search for URFs, uh, they often have you know, very different sizes. the big ones, the little ones, and so forth. And we got interested in this question, well, how small could they be, actually? We know it's hard to compute it. Um, so, oh yeah, there's an interesting unsolved problem for a computer science student who wants to uh, find something new. Anyway, carrying on. So we were interested in the size of the URAS. Now, here we've got the binary polymer model. We're increasing the catalyzation rate. And we look at where RAFs first emerge. This is the size of the max RAF, and this is the size of the um, irreducible RAFs that we find when we search for them. But we don't know, because the problem is MP-hard and we're just searching heuristically, we don't know that they might not be really tiny refs down here. So can we use, this is really where we need to use mathematics to uh, try and prove a theorem. And basically we're able to show that when refs first appear, in other words at this linear transition point, uh, you never get small um, refs. The probability that R0 contains a ref of size less than 2 to the Cn. C here is any constant less than one third. Uh, this goes to zero as n increases. And that's kind of, I found that interesting because uh, Bolabash, Bella Bolabash and uh, Rasmussen, way back in 1989, also motivated by considerations of origin of life, they'd said, well, let's look at random digraphs. Imagine you have points and you start putting cycles in sort of randomly. When will you first find a directed cycle? Sort of a slightly more primitive notion than what we're talking about here. 
And what they found is that when, you, when directed cycles do first appear, they're of all sizes. You have big ones, the small ones, and so forth. But for REFs, it's quite different. And I think what's going on here is that the REF couples these two concepts of F-generated and autocatalytic, and it's sort of somehow being able to satisfy those simultaneously, you can't do it with just a small subset. So that's just a, a recent result. Um, but these... I thought before you go from, from the size of the set, the, the food set, hasn't entered. It, it has it? entered, say, here. Uh, generally... Oh, T was the size of the food. T, okay. T, yeah. So two to the T. The length of the food. Yeah. 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 T is just the length of the food molecules. Yeah. Okay, so... Yeah. So in general, um, the max ref, of course, uh, can have quite an interesting <coughs> structure. Uh, it can t contain many other sub-refs. Um, here's one uh, ref we found in a simulation of the binary polymer model that breaks down into these two parts. And in fact, you can form the post set, the partially ordered set, the HASI diagram of that um, uh, in this way. So you can start to build up these things. You can compute these efficiently. Uh, finding all the maximal proper sub-refs of the max ref is uh, can be done in polynomial time. You can construct this, uh, the sub-refs, and there's a number of other things that are easy to compute in polynomial time. The, the reason that the sub-refs are, uh, are interesting, I think, is that um, is this idea that mm, uh, it, it, we're not just looking at one thing. Maybe, maybe this could then co-opt. We could have these things coming together and becoming a larger system, for example, uh, in early. Um, Biochemistry, so you, you need to. Have, it's useful to have some, some sort of insight in how, into how um, uh, refs are related to each other, how they can combine, and you also have sometimes the the notion of a set like this that is not a ref, but when you combine it with another ref, it is again a ref. So some other things that are easy to compute are listed here. For example, deciding if an arbitrary reaction is the difference of two. Um, refs is uh, easy. Um, I won't dwell on this too much. I just want to. So w what I would like to do is just talk about some of the recent ways in which um, this has been applied uh, to biological data. We saw this paper that appeared in Nature last year, uh, where a group. Um, I think Niles Lehman and others at Portland and elsewhere had constructed in the laboratory uh, some sort of um, self-sustaining autolytic, autocatalytic network based on RNA uh, ribosomes. And um, we sort of fit that into our framework, I guess. You have 16 reactions, 18 molecules, food set of size 2, 64 catalyzation pairs. We form, you can verify that it forms an RAF, um, contains many uh, sub refs and they looked at there were some they found of interest and they looked at the <coughs> dynamics. Here was one of the uh, sub refs, but actually even within that sub ref, um, we were, you can con easily construct the post set of all of the sub refs, and so almost half of the subsets of this uh, are um, are also refs. And we one of the things that Vim uh, wanted to do was to sort of emulate what they had done in their paper of studying the dynamics of these sub-refs, and he, he used the Gillespie algorithm to try to um, gain some more insight into the results from this paper. So I think this was, a, this was quite a, sort of satisfying in the sense that the biologists uh, involved in that study seemed to really appreciate that somehow what started off as a very abstract exercise was of use to them uh, in looking at a little bit more uh, of the features in their data than they had first seen. Okay, my second to last slide. Um, so I, I dwelt pretty much entirely on this talk on the vanilla model because uh, you know, it's easy to describe, but uh, it's, it's reasonable to look at um, extensions of this. Uh, one extension might be template-based catalysis. So if you have two molecules that want to come together, maybe one of them ends in zero like this and the other starts with, then you might want the ca catalyst to match this. So maybe you want this to be uh, the opposite of that, say 110 and 001. Maybe you need that subsequence in your molecule to act as a ca catalyst for this. 
Uh, or you might want the probability that X catalyzes are to depend on, for example, the lengths, maybe only long molecules, are good catalysts. We've also looked at what happens if the, you have a sort of partitioned system of molecules and we've looked at various scenarios where the catalysis might just be within or it might be that every molecule here catalyzes this and everyone here catalyzes the other and so forth. So what do we find in all of this? And I'm going to summarize basically all of this in really one sentence. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Uh, basically what we found was that all of these models behave almost the same, very close to, the vanilla model when we choose the catalyzation rate equal to what it is on average in each of these settings. Ha! I did it. <laughs> okay, so, so it's, it, it, yeah, the vanilla model, although it's a silly model, actually it emulates or, mo or predicts very um, closely what these other models will, will produce in terms of the probability of RAF formation. Uh, so we've also looked at what happens when you get away from the binary polymer model. You notice that um, in the binary polymer model, if I take the number of reactions and divide it by the number of molecules, I get N. Okay, and N played a key role in those formulae. Remember we had um, mu equal greater than lambda N. So for more general classes of catalytic reaction systems, you get similar results under certain assumptions if you replace N by this ratio, the ratio of number of reactions to number of molecules. Okay, that's almost it. Um, work ongoing uh, with some people in Germany. We're looking further at uh, modeling real biochemical networks, that is, ones of living primitive cells. We're looking uh, also at the impact of inhibition. So, Catalysis is all very fine, some molecule makes something go faster, but there's some molecules that will inhibit reactions. And maybe the reaction can't proceed if an inhibitor is present. That complicates the analysis a lot, even determining whether there's an RAF in this more general sense, where no reaction is inhibited by any of the molecules present, turns out to now be an NP hard problem. Uh, the, um, we, we also haven't really considered dynamics here, you want, for example, the rate at which some product that's used by another reaction is produced to be high enough that um, <coughs> there's enough of it around for the other reaction to proceed. Again, you can model that, but again, this turns out to be hard. So, I think that's probably me done, but I'm very happy to answer questions. needs to be explained in chemical evolution is how adaptations can arise before template replication. So how certain kinds of chemical reaction network can um, be selected for as opposed to others. But what you've explained is uh, the spontaneous formation of basically TAR, a, a complex um, uh, reaction network. And so I... Well, perhaps one thing I should say is that uh, at, at, the, at the place where these RAS form, at this linear relationship, you, you don't get tar, you don't get all the reactions, you, you get only a... You, you haven't explained how you can select for a subset of the reaction network. I, I, we, we're starting with the set of, say, the set of all reactions that were, in this case, present, the binary polymer model, but in general you could start with whatever reactions were going on in, say, early Earth, for example. But how would you get from your thing to nucleotides. So how do you get... Sure, sure. I, I, I shouldn't be... I'm not claiming to... T I'm, this is just one small part of a very complicated story. There's all sorts of uh, other things that we don't deal with at all in this story. But, but but, in a, I mean, yeah. in a paper that I wrote with Stu and Ursh, we showed that what's actually relevant is this very rare exponential structure, which is not a, an RAF, because that's a, a <coughs> chemical structure that can actually be selected for it. It's it's unlikely to form. That's what makes it important for evolution. And you can then compose uh, a separate, independent CAF. So I think the CAF is equivalent to our water catalytic core. And so there has to be some attempt, at least, to explain early evolvability, how adaptations can accumulate in chemical evolution. 
So why can't the RAFs be selected on? They can't. Why not? Because they they form spontaneously from the food set. There's no selectable variant. Some of them we model have the same. If you have the two food sets and two different RAFs forming with different sets of reactions, one can be selected over the other. If you have two different food sets, then you can yes. No, but not with the same, same food, food set. set. You can no, you can't. Combinations. You can't. Well, we, we saw that there were, you know, you can have potentially exponentially many RAFs with, you know, within the max RAF, yeah. and some of them might be. So if you have one food set, yes, then the RAF is never. The, the, but there's the, many different RAFs possible. Yeah. The you can select set. between those. One, one maximal RAF yeah. and many. Selection between those RAFs hasn't been demonstrated. Well, the the um, simulations that Vim did using the Gillespie algorithm showed that they. He could basically predict the results of the experiments that uh, Niles Lehman's group did. So, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, this is a small part of a, a much more complex story. Has it been demonstrated that RAFs can be selectable? Demonstrated in what way? In, uh, you can't in select. There's no simulation which is showing you can select for a specific RAF. Daniel? So I just had a question to understand, maybe if you can just go back one slide. Mm -hmm. your, your long sentence that ended up saying that the, the mu you needed was um, uh, linear and n. Um, but if I, so if I look at the template base catalyst, mm -hmm. so naively then I would say that things that only need a short template at each end are way overkill because they, each of those would then catalyze a lot of others. Mm -hmm. right? So you actually can get away with things that need a template where they have to cover substantial fraction of the length of the ones there. So, so what I was claiming is the, the um, probability of ref formation in such a system yeah. would be about the same as in the vanilla model where, the, where every molecule had the same um, probability of catalyzing each reaction, but in, where you choose that catalyzation rate uh, according to, to match. So the average catalyzation rate was the same across both systems. Right, but that must mean that the, the, te the template one because let's say naively with template one, each molecule can template lots of other reactions, and so you think you, that you don't need anything anything like that. You can yeah. So so the models look thing. quite different, but when you look at the probability of a ref formation, they, they match up um, quite well. He's factoring that in because each one in, in the kind of naive template model, because each one can template lots of reactions. Mu in the vanilla model be very high. Right. So therefore, once you. Can, Therefore, the template one very easily forms around. Well, you see, it's all explained by that change in mu. You can understand it by that change in mu. And it, no, you, no, you, no, yeah. I understand that, yeah, the consequence of that statement. Yeah. Yeah, did you incorporate error in your uh, model as well? Error. When catalysis is happening, there's, it's erroneous? No, no, we don't. That would be something that could be done here. Yeah. Not Somebody. writing about dynamics, but thinking about uh, equilibrium solutions still. If you take into account the amount of each uh, result, each reactant and product and so on, do you get competition between different rafts and is there some selection? Yeah, so, so the, the, you, you'll notice that you know, we, we throw out a lot here. We throw out you know, concentrations, for example. And I mean, part of the idea is somehow that, that less is more. With less, we can say more. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the... the this, these simulations that Vim has done, they have taken into account concentrations, and that's been looked at. You know, this do do some refs outcompete others in some sense. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Yes.